think, my dear brothers and sisters, in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the readings that we had, in the reading that we had this morning from Mark chapter 10, there's a very interesting picture painted for us. But I'd like to point out firstly that Mark was at pains to make a pointed remark in verse 17 that Jesus was in the way. He was in the way from the beginning of his ministry, in the way to the cross. But more so now, because he's in the vicinity or close to Jericho, and he's just a few days away from crucifixion. And to make the point even more in the final verse of Mark chapter 10 and verse 52, we are told that blind Bartimaeus followed Jesus in the way. So what an interesting set of scenes Mark has painted for us. We get Jesus in the way, but just before that, we get children coming to him trustingly. Then we get this rich young ruler with his fine, expensively tailored clothes, jeweled turban, jeweled fingers, running to Jesus, kneeling down to him in reverence. And after the interactions, he walks away very sad. And thereafter, there's another picture painted. A picture of this big camel, a burden of beast, an unclean animal under the law. And camel generally have a lot of fleas and not the most beautiful of animals to behold. You get a picture of this, of Jesus painting, that this animal is actually going through the eye of a needle. And I believe that needle is a literal needle, the needle with which we stitch our clothes. And then there's the astonishment, dumbfoundedness of the disciples. And in between, although Mark doesn't have it, the sequel to this, the comparable record in, in, in Matthew, in chapter 20, we are told of a very unusual in incident. Uh, a picture is painted for us of, uh, of this landowner, the owner of this vineyard that goes and employs people from the morning to the evening, and he pays the same amount of money for those that came in the, in, in, in the morning hour to work at six o'clock in the morning. And then the, the same amount is paid to those that came at 11 o'clock. Very unusual indeed. But to those that came later who were not contract workers, he said, you go and work, I'll, I'll pay you what's right. And they trusted in him to do what is right. And then finally we get blind by Timaeus, son of Timaeus. Actually, Bartimaeus means son of the unclean and son of Timaeus also means son of the unclean. This man, Jesus calls him, throws away his garment, trusting and having faith in Jesus that he'd be able to pick it up again. And then he follows Jesus on the way. It's a lovely set of incidents there, brothers and sisters. We don't have the time in this morning exhortation as it is. We have a lot of ground to cover. But perhaps you can consider it in your own time. We're going to look this morning at this rich young ruler. The gospel records paint him as a, a, a rich young man. He's very reverential. He was zealous and he was sincere. And Jesus loved him. And in verse 17, we read, oh, we read that he says, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Matthew's record adds in, verse, in chapter 19 and verse 16, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? To the mind of this man as to 
most of us, eternal life means not merely endless life, but a settled happy cause of being in a God-controlled world. A life that is not in liability to death implies a state of perfect health, a coordination of, of body and mind into which our present modern limitations cannot enter. And in verse 18, we read, and Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Yes, the Almighty is good in a sense in which it could not be claimed for any other being, for he alone is the source of all the benefits enjoyed by those whom he has created. The master was not questioning his own sinlessness. He would not have displayed his son of, as a son of man a model of perfect humility had he not ascribed to his father all the virtue that was in him. Please keep your place in Mark, brothers and sisters, and let us now turn our attention to Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a Psalm of David, and it is a highly messianic Psalm. Psalm 16 and verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is the spirit of Christ speaking in this Psalm, and we know that David saw corruption, so this applies to only one person and that is Jesus. Now let us have a look at verse two of Psalm 16. O oh my soul, thou hast said unto Yahweh, thou art my Lord, my goodness extended not to thee. Now the New King James and uh, most of the other translations, including the Tanna, rendered this verse. O oh my soul, you have said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. So God is the source of all goodness. And Jesus, God's Holy One, as the scriptures refer to him, disclaimed the absolute goodness which belonged to God only. That's the lesson that we all need to learn, my dear brothers and sisters, when compiling an estimate, firstly, of ourselves, and of others, that we have no goodness apart from the influence of God upon our lives. A very interesting marker for yourself to look at later is also 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 29 to 30. We don't have the time to turn there, but you can have a look at it at your leisure. Don't call me good, said Jesus. It is something that we need to get clearly in our minds, brothers and sisters, as it will help a great deal in life, as it tells us that in Christ, life has got to be lived without self. So that we have no trust in one's own estimation of things, no trust in one's ability, no confidence in one's self-control or discipline. Coming back to Mark chapter 10, the Lord Jesus gives the young man a direct answer to the question at issue, an answer that any devout servant in the ruler's household could have given him. He didn't have to come to this rabbi. Mark chapter 10 and verse 19, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy mother, sorry, honor thy father and mother. The standard, the standard answers, answer of the rabbis would have been to go back to the law. But this young man was looking for a new idea. That is why he came to a new teacher. He was rich. He was young. He was a ruler. He had apparently everything going for him. But there was a yearning on his inside. There was a chasm that he was looking to fill. The Lord knew that the man knew the commandments, but he wanted him to see at last where his real problem was. And in order to do that, the Lord gave him 
a list of commandments in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all of which come from the second tablet of the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, you know them. And all the Jews, I suppose, would know the Ten Commandments. Even I knew them in order once. One would have thought that the Lord would immediately put his finger upon the problem of the young man in the first tablet of the commandments concerning God. You see, the Lord knew that too. But he wanted the young man to see the problem for himself. Just like we all need to see our problems for ourselves. Because the one thing that he lacked was to understand God. For all his keeping of commandments, he didn't know his heavenly father. And the Lord knew that. But the young man didn't realize that God was missing in his life. And this is the factor that had created a void within him and caused him to come running to Jesus, yearning for this void to be filled. And now he has a big problem because he expected something better from this teacher of whom he had heard so much. All he is getting is what he got from the rabbis. Verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. And Matthew adds, verse 20, Matthew 19, 20 adds, what lack I yet? What is missing in my life? What lack I yet? This we take to be a statement of fact, my dear brothers and sisters, and not a mark of arrogance. Jesus loved this young man. He probably had no notion of haunting his own faultless manner of life. He merely wished to state that if this was all the teacher had to tell him, then there were no fresh fields for him to conquer. This void is still going to be within him. Exemplary in conduct he was. His wealth and his status had developed in him some self-complacency based on the false assumption that eternal life could be gained by him doing something. What good thing shall I do? He was in the position of a man who visits a specialist, complaining of some minor, slight, I should say, physical uneasiness, which he supposed a tonic or a change of diet might remove, only to be told that he had serious heart trouble or an abnormality which only a major operation could remove. As Jesus was to diagnose his problem on the spot. Verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Yeah, was an application of the law this man had not considered and one which turned his view of duty upside down. It seems at first thought a somewhat harsh director. The young man was plainly told to give up his home, his wealth and his position, and his position in society, and to become a destitute wanderer, to follow this poor bed of, of pilgrims. We can scarcely question that the method of the Lord had adopted was the wisest and most far-sighted at that time. And we'll come to this point a bit later. The Lord answered that man on the spot and it's exactly what he needed at that point in time. This man's possession stood in the way of his spiritual advancement. Whether the call to follow me involved a literal walking with the master as one of his disciples, I implied that the Lord must take first place in his life. We don't know. All it called was for a complete self-denial. Because of the exacting nature of the demand, 
and perhaps because of the weakness of his own will, the disintegration of the ruler's hopes appeared immediate, my dear brothers and sisters. And we know for ourselves that Christ said in John chapter 17 and verse 3, life eternal was to have an experiential knowledge of God and of himself. In other words, to think and act as they would. This young man had come to Christ with a void in his life, a yearning for something more than he currently possessed. He came asking what good thing he should do to have eternal life. To fill that void in his life, he now needed to do what God has done from the beginning with all his bounty and then to follow and to emulate Christ's way of life. Discipleship is a way of experience. He could read it all in the books, in the Ten Commandments. But to experience it is eternal life, Jesus said. We remember God's servant Job, don't we? He thought, why am I going through these problems? What is this major disturbance in my life? I lost all my 10 children. I lost my health. I lost my wealth. I lost everything. Was this necessary? And later, when God expounded to him his power and wisdom in nature, God said to Job, indirectly, Job, what you're going through is bound by the same wisdom that controls the rest of creation. And what did Job say? But the hearing of the years are ahead of you, but now I've seen you. It was an experience he needed to go through. And this man and all of us need to go through the same experience that God and Christ will choose for each one of us, my dear brothers and sisters. Sell and give to the poor, said Christ. God so loved the world that he gave. And when you think about Israel, he gave them a law. He gave them shoes that never wore off. He rained quails from heaven. He dried up the sea. He dried up the Jordan. He conquered seven, the seven nations of Canaan. He gave them other people's lands and houses. He gave them judges. He gave them kings, my dear brothers and sisters. He gave them continuously. And finally, he gave them his only begotten son. And that's where this young man lacked. He couldn't give anything. Yes, he could do a lot of things, but when he was asked to do the most important thing he needed to do at this moment in his life, he couldn't give. The Apostle Paul says of Jesus that though he was rich, and he was rich, as a son of the maker of the universe, he was heir of all things. But yet he became poor voluntarily that we might be saved. Gave his life, my dear brothers and sisters. And the next time there is an opportunity to do, there's nothing wrong in doing, let us go on and do it. And also when there is an opportunity to give. And if it's in our power to do so, let us give. Let us give when nobody else can see. Even if it hurts, it is between us and God, who is the giver of all things. And so the young man was asked to take up his cross and follow Jesus on the way. His problem was failing to give what it was in his power to do so. Why? Because of his trust in his riches. Jesus tells us that. Instead of trusting in the living God who blessed him in the first place with the riches, for us the lesson is clear. As on the cross was written, the problem of the life of each person that carried the cross to be crucified. It was written on the cross for everyone to see. Now different people have different problems in life. What may be my major problem may be different from yours. And today we don't necessarily certainly advertise or discuss our problems with one another. But as Jesus helped that young man draw out his problem for himself, so we must, through the power of the word and the perfect example of Christ, whom we remember every week through the emblems, do the same. The conviction dawns upon us, my dear brothers and sisters, as we feed on the life of Jesus. 
And then when we see how far short we fall of his life and the big problem that is causing self to assert itself over the commands of Christ. Now, Brother Dennis Gillard puts it in the following words about self-denial and cross-caring. And thank you, Sister Cheryl, for sharing this with us in the daily meditations. Just a few verses. Brother Gillard says, you can approve but not follow. You can applaud but not follow. You can understand and preach without following. You can defend the truth pugnaciously without following. You can tire yourself out with busy works and still not follow. The central thing is the denial of self. It is radical. Denial of self is the inward thing. Taking up the cross is the external manifestation of an inward condition, end of quote. For us, Christ is the supreme example. Christ at this very time in his ministry was bracing himself for the supreme surrender. In submission to the will of his father, he had set aside all present claims to a settled home, human comforts, worldly honor and power, and they based himself to the prospect of a cruel death. He came not to be a minister, I'm too, but to minister to others, and not to enrich, but to impoverish himself, that through his poverty, many might become rich. The young ruler was bidden to give his riches to the poor and follow Christ so that he may gain the riches that really matter. One thing you lack, Jesus said to him. One thing you lack. So this rich young ruler, in spite of his aspirations, was mastered by his wealth. And we know that no man can serve two masters. We've been saying it from time immemorial. But boy, do some of us try. Yours truly is also guilty of that at times. If you have surrendered to one force, you cannot be mastered by another. What he really lacked was the right master. The dominating principle of his life was gold, and it should have been Christ. With Christ as his shepherd, he would have lacked nothing. What of us, my dear brothers and sisters? Is Christ truly about our shepherd? Most of us would have recited Psalm 23 in our lives. Even if not the whole Psalm, at least the first two verses. Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want, said David. I shall not want, or I shall not lack, or I shall not fail, or I shall not decrease. Yahweh, the great and terrible one, the creator of heaven and of earth, glorious in power and excellent in strength, is yet a shepherd. He is a shepherd of tender watchfulness and anxiety for his dependent flock. And the prophets often desired to depict their great and mighty God as the shepherd of Israel. And we want to have a look at one example in Isaiah chapter 40. Please can we turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Whatever Old Testament fulfillment this prophecy may have had, it obviously looked forward to a greater fulfillment through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 9 and 10, Zion is bid, as it were, to climb the highest mountain within reach and announce the advent of the mighty one of Israel, their God who would ultimately save them. 
Their God who is working on a new creation, a spiritual creation. Now, when all eyes are turned to look at this God, expecting a mighty hero warrior, lo, we, we see a shepherd. And the shepherd, what is he doing? He's, he's conducting his flock across the wastelands. Gathering the weekly ones into his bosom and gently leading the youth with young. God may be almighty and powerful, but to his flock, he has a shepherd's heart. And this is what that young man turned away from. Words can never tell out all his tenderness, his compassion, his understanding love. And what assurance that God can bring about this new creation and fulfill what he has said in the preceding verses. Have a look at verse 12. And you can look at the rest of the verses after verse 12 at your own leisure, brothers and sisters. We don't have the time right now. Verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has done all these things? This and the following verses my dear brothers and sisters, are the assurances that God who promises this new creation of which you and I are called to, has the power and the wisdom to do it. The one whose might and wisdom framed the existing creation has not exhausted his resources. By no means. So then, my dear brothers and sisters, faith in a promised new creation is not misplaced. He measures the waters in a cupped hand. Just to think of it, brothers and sisters. Just picture the scene. The mighty oceans of the world with their titanic storms and their unplumbed depths are like a mere mouthful to drink from. The hollow of the hand of a God so great. The casual span of his hand measures out the vast millions of light years to the remotest corner of the universe. And the prophet repeats this theme in verses 22 and 26. Yet, though the mountains depart and the hills be removed, said Isaiah in chapter 54 and verse 10, God's kingdom shall not depart, nor his covenant of peace be removed. The mightiest things in God's world and not so sure of his eternal purposes. So then, these few expressions that we have seen in Isaiah, the language of calculation, uh, the language of measuring, marking off and weighing up, is all that of a building, is it not? He would rebuild Zion and rebuild his kingdom. He would build according to the plans, and those plans have now been revealed to Isaiah and the other prophets. It's interesting, too, that the same word for measure is used multiple times in, in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 42, where Israel are commanded to measure. But we know, my dear brothers and sisters, that the new spiritual creation of which Jesus is the head is not made of brick and mortar, but living stones. Flesh and blood becoming flesh and spirit that would be shaped by the power of the word of God under the great and good shepherd of the Father's providing. And here's the point that I want to make. It is this wisdom and skill and power and tenderness and the love with which Jesus loved that he asked this rich young ruler to do what he did at that particular moment in his life. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and you have treasure in heaven and take up your cross and follow me. Not all of us asked to do that. Zacchaeus wasn't, but he, he is the one. 
So let us, my dear brothers and sisters, implicitly trust, even if it means major spiritual heart surgery for each one of us. Let us trust the great shepherd that we are following. Let us trust, sorry, trust through the contradictions, the adversity, and the apparent denials. How many of our prayers have been answered? How many of our prayers have been answered? Through all that, God bids us to trust. We do not always know the reason for our disturbances, but we know the disturber. We can trust him. And we will provide, and he will provide for all our needs, both material and spiritual. The rich young ruler said, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? In Psalm 23, we see the good shepherd doing everything for the sheep, and there is no lack. So then let, let him see to our wants. We need nothing outside of him. His pastures are tender grass. His waters, waters of rest. He refreshes us when exhausted. He heals when diseased. He restores from wandering. He leads in right paths. Though steep, he accompanies us into the valley with the club for our foes and the shepherd's crook for the pits to pick us up. Spreads our table amid hatred and to all the problems that we are going through. And he protects our rear with the twin angels, goodness and mercy. Come back to Mark chapter 10, please. Mark chapter 10, and G, uh, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. And we can understand why they were astonished, because riches were a sign of a blessing from God. In the Old Testament, and it, it, God clearly says, if you follow my commandments, I will bless you with flocks and herds and fields and houses. And this man, he's blessed above measure. He's rich and he's a ruler. So if he can't make it into the kingdom, who can? But Jesus answered again and said unto them, children, how hard is it for them to trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Children. Remember just before he go on the way, he gathers the children came to him and he said, let the children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Children is a very appealing term. Children in Christ's day were trusting and they were also teachable to receive instruction. Verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I don't want to labor the point we understand the figure. Christ said, it is impossible for those that trust in riches. So riches is a blessing. It's not a curse, but it can become a curse if we trust it. So then to the 12 and to all the true followers came the master's encouraging assurance that every instance of self-sacrifice, be it of home, family, or lands, there will be a blessing in this age and in the age to come. We will in a few minutes partake in the emblems. And we think now about our Lord Jesus Christ. From his youth up, Jesus had followed the path of self-denial, seeking always to put his father's will before his own. Towards the end of his earthly ministry, he had steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing full well what there awaited him. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. 
In all these ways, my dear brothers and sisters, our Lord was the example of self-sacrifice. So in, rem in remembering the example of Jesus, in taking the emblems of his giving of himself, we shall thank God and resolve more fervently to set the pattern before us, which we see in his son, in whom there was nothing like him. And as we prepare our minds now to partake in this emblem, I am going to read it for you from a short extract as a way of conclusion by our brother Dennis Skillet on surrender. He says, in practice, it may have to be drastic if you mean business. The king has prepared us for this. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. If the, thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out. Could it involve father, mother, wife, child, some good thing which has become a curse, some indulgence which is sapping your strength, some association which is leading you away from the truth, some ambition which is ruining your character, some flirting with temptation which is enticing you toward perdition, some shutting out of the light which is stifling your conscience, or again, it may be anything like this. Perhaps some simple neglect of the things which ought to have your whole attention. Some weariness which interferes with faithful service. Some doubt which cramps your energy and your devotion. Whatever the impediment, the king urges us to surrender ourselves to him without reservation. In that surrender, we can find salvation and sanctuary. Amen.